Okay, great. Hi, I'm Huan Qing, and today we are going to talk about classifying the evolutionary states of GMCs in M33. This is a collaborative work done by the five of us, Milani, Gail3, me, Constantine, and Eloise, e and uh, supervised by Eric and Annie. Uh, you will probably ask, uh, classifying hundreds of clouds look tedious, so why do we even do that? So, well, we do this because comparing GMCs in different evolutionary states sheds lies on the fundamental question, how GMCs accrete gas, form stars, and get dispersed. All these processes impact the observables like the mass function and line width. Also, the evolution states of GMCs may be related to their environment and morphology, and even lead to the differences in some constants we typically assume. So it's crucial to look into all these quantities in different GMC evolutionary classes and check if there are significant differences. Uh, we target M33 to tackle, tackle uh, all these problems because M33 is very close to us and nearly face on, so we can observe every individual cloud in it. And now it's time to look into M33 because we now have multi-wavelength data, especially the new high resolution AMA data, which Constantine will talk about next. Now let us introduce you to the observational data and methodology that we used in this project. Here on the left, we are showing you a picture of M33 in the phi UV band. And on top in blue, we are showing you the contours of the giant molecular clouds that we locate in studies and the new all my ACA data in the CO2 to one line. I went to high, <clears throat> sorry, the resolution of ALMA, which translates to 30 parsecs spatial resolution and uniqueness of M33 that was mentioned above. We were able to identify almost 450 structures. And for that, we have used the SCIME package, which in turn uses dendrogram to find positions as well as boundaries of the clouds and estimate some of their properties. Once we have the positions and the contours of the clouds, we can locate them in different bands of the electromagnetic spectrum and then use archival data to assess star formation activity using the corresponding tracers. Elise? Yes, so for each GMC, we have six maps to check. The contour illustrates the boundary of the GMC in question. First, the ALMA CO2 to one uh, map over the cloud. This shows the velocity profile of the molecular emission. Then we have the Spitzer 24 micron emission map, which shows emission from the warm dust in the galaxy, which is frequently associated with embedded star formation. Overlaid on the emission, there are square symbols showing radio emission sources. The Spitzer 8 micron image traces emission from polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are good for tracing embedded ionization regimes. At the bottom left, the H-alpha emission map from the local group survey. Then we have a map showing far UV sources from AstroSat. This can be associated with young stars and clusters. Finally, the HST image in black and white shows us compact stellar clusters. K3. Okay, so we essentially classified these GMTs based on whether they were showing signatures of no star formation, massive star formation only, or active star formation. And in literature, these are classified as type one, type two, and type three evolutionary states of a GMC. So the signs we were looking for were whether the GMCs had any compact H2 regions, which would trace massive star formation only, or whether they had more embedded star formation traced by 24 micron and eight micron maps and also far ultraviolet sources. We also segregated the GMCs based on whether they were round structures or more extended structures. So in the end, this turned out to be sort of a miniature citizen science project, and it took us a lot of time to sort of refine our classification scheme. And once we did this classification, we then moved on to the more juicy bit of doing some analysis, and Melanie will tell you more about the results that we received. Yeah, so through this classification of our 442 clouds, uh, we try to find patterns to link to the star formation inside those clouds. And as we go to the, uh, we started with the, the most simple uh, connection, uh, which is a link between the morphology and the size of uh, our clouds to the content, 
which is an indicator of uh, the star formation inside of those clouds. And we find that the bigger the clouds are uh, going to be, and the more complex in morphology they're going to be, the more star formation indicators we are going to find in uh, those clouds. It's directly linked to the uh, mass of the clouds, which is another indicator of a uh, star formation. So the more massive they're going to be, the more star formation we're going to find inside those clouds. And if we try to find the link now with the environment of those clouds, so we looked at the distance um, of those clouds from the galactic center of the, the galaxy, and we found uh, two uh, main uh, trends. The, one, uh, the first one is that in the inner part of the galaxy, so inside two kiloparsec, uh, we found that uh, the clouds are going to be uh, more complex in terms of morpho morphology, which is, uh, as I just said, um, an indicator of a star formation because they're going to be more massive and have more content. And um, we see that after four kiloparsec distance from the galactic center, we see a drop in the massive uh, clouds, which means that we no longer see massive cloud form outside this, um, this distance. And uh, this result is uh, also shown uh, with the weaker evidence, but still she saw the link when we look at the virial mass and at the mass of the cloud. And finally, uh, we try to find uh, a link and try to uh, see if there is a trend between the turbulence in inside those clouds and uh, the ev evolutionary state of these clouds. And we know uh, we yet not have seen anything really to, to talk about, but um, um, we have the results if you want to see in the appendix of this presentation. And uh, of course, we are going to need to uh, check many more hypotheses to completely um, study this uh, massive uh, classification that we did. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there is a question uh, in the Slack. Could you be biased by extinction for far UV optical? Uh, that is when classifying the giant molecular cloud using presence or stars clusters. Yeah, maybe I can take this. So uh, one of the maps that we had that you may have seen was actually uh, showing the optical, you know, optical data. And we did actually find the extinction values uh, for that map um, in, you know, from the original FAT survey. Um, and uh, that is like, so we did check for extinction, um, but that's just a completely different category that we could definitely explore more um, with further analysis. So that's kind of all we can say at this stage. Okay, thank you.